so it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Atlanta, uh, Atlanta's own Dr. Melanie Thompson, who most of you are familiar with her, and sometimes it's hard to appreciate how famous and well-known people are outside your own hometown, and she's extremely famous and well-known for her work in HIV research and treatment, and also primary care and developing education materials and primary care guidelines. And we'll turn it over to Dr. Thompson to talk to us about the routine immunizations and changes around vaccination. Melanie, thank you. Thank you. So tell me, which clicker is the one that works? Uh, this one, did someone up here? That was the one that didn't work. Unless somebody moved it. Somebody moved it. Oh, well, we're already halfway through the talk. Let's see. Hey, great, thank you so much. Um, well, it's great to be the closer today, the person sitting between you and I-75. So, uh, <laughs> so um, but I'm really happy to be here today to talk about routine immunizations, and it will be focused on adults um, with HIV. Uh, disclosure, learning objectives are in your packet. <clears throat> so, Today's menu, um, I want to run through some contraindications for people with HIV. Uh, also, just hit on COVID, pneumococcus, hepatitis B, meningococcus, and MPOX in particular. Uh, but first, let's just run through a definition. You will see moderate to severe immunocompromise all over vaccine guidelines. And so what is that? Well, relevant to HIV, it uh, includes advanced HIV infection, and that is defined as untreated HIV or CD4 less than 200, a prior AIDS-defining illness without uh, immune reconstitution, and symptomatic HIV. And then importantly, people who are on treatment that could be immunosuppressive, and here's a little laundry list of that. And just important for us to remember that as cancer is becoming one of the biggest killers of people with HIV, uh, we may have many people with HIV who fall in more than one bucket. So what's special for people with HIV? Well, contraindicated in all people with HIV are the live attenuated influenza virus, the live attenuated smallpox virus a uh, vaccine, um, ACAM 2000, which uh, is also being rolled out for MPOX, but not in people with HIV. And then also for people whose CD4 counts are less than 200 or have uncontrolled HIV, we would not give them the live attenuated typhoid vaccine, um, MMR vaccine, varicella, or yellow fever. And there is a caveat that, you know, we know people whose CD4 is low um, may do better if we're able to reconstitute their CD4 count with antiretroviral therapy. And in some cases, you may hold off on certain vaccines until their CD4 count is a little better, if that's going to happen. So here is uh, the ACIP adult routine immunization schedule, hot off the press for 2024. And I have uh, outlined in red the columns that pertain to HIV by CD4 count. And so I want to run through just a couple of special notes for people with HIV. We're going to go through the ones in purple. I've already mentioned the ones in red. But I do want to just call out um, Shingrix or the recombinant zoster vaccine now is recommended for all people with HIV 18 years and older, regardless of CD4 cell count. Uh, for HPV vaccine, remember we are giving three doses uh, for people with HIV, and the hepatitis A vaccine is recommended for all people with HIV. So uh, let's start with COVID vaccination. Yes, it is still here. Um, and the recommendations do keep changing, and that's appropriate. So first, just to remember that um, people who have low CD4 counts are at higher risk for ICU admission, for mechanical ventilation, and for death. And people with HIV who have had COVID may be one and a half times more likely to get reinfected. 
So for people who have great CD4 counts, that virus is suppressed and so on, they can probably be vaccinated, same as the general population. But people who have this moderate or severe immunocompromise or advanced HIV uh, fall into a different category, and these are the uh, recommendations we'll go through. So here is um, the web page, and all of these are listed at the bottom of the slides for your reference. Um, so there are three pages that give us recommendations for uh, Moderna, for Pfizer, and for Novavax vaccines. And these are very succinct and very helpful. So for people who have not been vaccinated, and there still are a lot of people out there who haven't been vaccinated, um, we are now giving the 2023-24 vaccines, which I'll call the updated vaccine, as an initial series. Um, it's said that homologous doses are preferred, but get what you can. Um, and here's the timing. So this is one thing to keep in mind. Um, the timing is different for different types of vaccines. For Moderna, the second dose would be at least four weeks after the first dose. And for Pfizer and Novavax, uh, that is at least three weeks after the second dose. And then for both Moderna and Pfizer, the third dose would be at least four weeks um, after the second dose. And Novavax is a two vaccine series, so that doesn't apply. And then what about these folks who are previously partially vaccinated with older vaccines? Well, a prior partial series of one to two mRNA doses, remember MRA, mRNA is a three dose series, you basically want to get them up to three doses, uh, giving them one or two extra vaccinations according to the schedule that I've listed there. Uh, if they've had one dose of Novavax or Janssen, then they need one more dose of any vaccine, any of the 2023-24 vaccines. So then once people have had an initial series, what about these additional doses? So basically everybody should have had a 2023-24 updated vaccine at least eight weeks after their last dose. And then the subsequent doses are based on age and based on risk. So for people 65 or older, uh, the recommendation is that they should have an additional updated vaccine, and that's at least eight weeks after the last dose. And for people who are in the 19 to 64 age group, you may give them a dose. It really depends on their risk, and subsequent doses are going to be based on risk. But again, that eight-week time period. So let's go to something that's getting easier over time, okay? Uh, <laughs> pneumococcal vaccination. So a couple of basics about pneumococcal vaccination. Two types of vaccines, the conjugate vaccines, um, are polysaccharides from various serotypes that are joined to a diphtheria toxin that is non-toxic, and that boosts the immune response. And when we say PCV20, that means there are 20 serotypes in that vaccine. And then the older polysaccharide vaccine, which we call PPSV23, there's only one of those that we're using now, um, that has 23 serotypes. And just remember that unless PCV20 is given, the PPSV23 should be part of the series. But really, everybody needs a conjugate vaccine, and that should be their first vaccine, ideally. So we have these new kids in town, um, the PCV20 and 15. And what I would point out to you is that only with PCV15 do we have a lot of data for people with HIV. Uh, so that is one of the drawbacks of PCV20 at this time. But uh, we're hearing a lot about the one and done method, okay? And that is that a single dose of PCV20 completes any pneumococcal vaccine series. So, if there is no prior pneumococcal vaccine or the status is unknown, you can give a PCV20 and you're done. You can also give a PCV15, but if you do that, 
they need a polysaccharide vaccine also at least eight weeks later. And then they are done. But a lot of our folks have prior vaccinations, right? So we've got people who have had PCV13s, who had a polysaccharide vaccine. If they have only had one dose of vaccine and it's a PCV13, or if it's a polysaccharide, you can give PCV20 at least a year later, done. You can also give a PCV15 if what they has, have had is a polysaccharide vaccine, and that also completes the series. All right, so what about people who have had both the PCV13 and polysaccharide, maybe one or two doses? So at any age, you can give them a PCV20, and that completes the series. You can also give a, PC, a, a polysaccharide vaccine after the age of 65, and that also completes the series. But there is an option for people over 65 who have had a full series to consider a, with shared decision making, that is talk to the patient, um, about giving a PCV20 vaccine, and this would be for patients uh, for whom we have concern about their risk of exposure uh, or their risk for severe disease. And that would be at least five years after their last vaccine. So, pros and cons of this one and done with PCV20? Well, it's simple. There's only one vaccine to stock. Um, there's an adherence advantage, right? They don't have to come back for more vaccines. So that's all good. Um, I mentioned that we are lacking in clinical data uh, for people with HIV, particularly those uh, with impaired immunity. Uh, and also this vaccine is more expensive as a single dose than the other vaccines, but probably not more expensive if you take all the doses of a series into consideration. But don't get too attached to this. So I tell my patients, you are done until we get more guidelines. <laughs> so so um, PCV21 is in phase three. Um, it is apparently going to the FDA in June of 2024. This is called V116 at this point. It has eight unique serotypes that are not in any of the older vaccines. And there are data in people with HIV. And the immune response um, looks promising for these eight serotypes. So don't get too attached to easy things, uh, but hopefully this will be a, a, also another good option. Um, CDC has a lot of pneumococcal resources. I've put links and so on for you on the slides here. Um, it's great to print them out and have them uh, nearby. Okay, let's talk about hepatitis B vaccination. That's been a hot topic already today. Um, and, you know, I could probably skip half of this because we've talked about it, but I am going to run through the data again, uh, some of the data again. Okay, so right now, our current recommendations for people with HIV 18 years and older are the recombinant vaccines. And I want to point out that the OI guidelines recommend double strength if you're giving recombinant vaccines. So for Ingerix B, sorry, I'm going to use trade names, um, double strength is 40 micrograms. For Recombivax, double strength is 20 micrograms. And these are a series of three doses. Uh, we also have the recombinant adjuvanted vaccine, which is Hep B CPG, or Heplosav, and this is the one we'll talk more about today. Um, and, of course, Twinrix is still around. That's the combination A and B vaccine. Um, I also just want to mention Prehevrio. Prehevrio is a vaccine with three antigens, a recombinant vaccine. It is approved, but there really are scant data in people with HIV. It's not currently recommended um, in any of our guidelines specifically for people with HIV simply because of that. But remember, whatever you do, vax and verify, okay? Um, you want to get those hepatitis B surface antibody titers one to two months after the last dose. And if they are less than 10, then you want to revaccinate. 
and we'll talk about that in a minute. A seroprotective response is going to be a titer that is at least 10, so keep that in mind. All right, let's talk about this adjuvanted vaccine. We've already heard some about it um, from Jeff. Um, this is called Heplosav. It is um, recombinant with a TLR9 adjuvant to boost the immune response. So in people without HIV, there are a couple of data sets. The two doses of Heplosav were superior to single strength in Jarex B, okay? In chronic kidney disease, and I think this is interesting because this is a population of people who often don't respond well to vaccines, so three doses of Heplosav produced an 89% uh, seroprotective response, and the comparator was four double-strength doses of the recombinant vaccine, and that was 81%. So I think this shows that this is quite an immunogenic vaccine. I do want to uh, point out that more people had a high antibody titer with the Heplosav than with the recombinant vaccine, and by high, I mean more than 100 million international units per mil. Um, and then, please remember, we don't have data in pregnancy, so this vaccine is not to be used in pregnancy right now. And so the uh, study that Jeff referred to as Beehive earlier, that is an ACTG study. Its number is 5379. Uh, it has two parts. This is the first part of that study. It was published last year, at the end of the year. And so this is a cohort of people without prior hepatitis B vaccination. And let me call out that this is a single-arm, non-randomized, open-label study. Um, the median CD4 was pretty high, okay, in the 600s. Uh, the viral load was um, suppressed in 96% of people, and these folks had um, a normal BMI. 66% um, were from Thailand. So these may not be the population who are walking into your clinic, but... The data were very impressive. So after two doses, the seroprotective response, so that's greater than 10 for antibody titer, was 98.5% um, for people. That's after two doses. Then they got the third dose, and the rest of those people also got a seroprotective response. So we're up to 100% um, seroprotective response a month after three doses. And in addition, 88% um, of these folks had titers of antibody that were greater than 1,000. Not 100, but 1,000. Now, we don't really know what that means, but it may correlate with durability, and that's the hope these people will continue to be followed. Jeff also mentioned um, the non-responder cohort of this same study, okay? So these are people who previously did get vaccinated, but they did not get a seroprotective response. And so I want to point out just a little more detail uh, than you were able to see earlier. Um, big picture, both two and three doses of Heplosav were superior to Ingerix B. It was designed as uh, a study for non-inferiority, but actually there was superiority. And in all these little purple boxes, I know you can't see all the print, but let me just tell you that these are the subgroup analyses. So the one on top is age greater than 60. You can see by the separation of the dots, the black dots are Ingerix. The, um, Salmon and the teal colored are two and three doses of Heplosav. So you can kind of see uh, the um, spread between those seroprotective responses. Um, but you have to be cautious, okay? If you look at the CD4 cell counts, they look awesome, okay? So less than 200 CD4 count, 100% response. But there were only three people who got three doses. So these are small subgroups. So I think we have to not overinterpret. Nonetheless, the immunogenicity seems to be very good. 
So our current recommendations for non-responders, if immunity is not achieved after a full series, then we should revaccinate with a full series. And that means three double-strength doses of the recombinant vaccine or two doses, these are current recommendations, of the Heplosav B. Um, and then again, if you can vaccinate people after their CD4 rises, they are likely to get a better response. So there are some other strategies that are being considered, and I want to emphasize these are not recommended by any guidelines right now, but because of the immunogenicity, uh, some people are considering giving three doses of Heplosav for revaccination when there have been prior failures. Um, and then uh, another strategy would be give two doses of Heplosav and measure that titer. So a month or two later, and if it's less than 10, then give a third dose. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about this hepatitis C, uh, hepatitis B core antibody. Um, this is the slide I said earlier that I would skip, but I guess I lied. Um, but uh, <laughs> so this is a little confusing, but by itself, the core antibody does not mean either that somebody has active HIV or that they're immune. But when someone has an isolated core antibody, meaning that they have a negative surface antibody, a negative surface antigen, then they most likely will not have uh, active hepatitis B. The OI guidelines um, say that hepatitis B DNA testing is not routinely recommended for everybody with a hepatitis uh, B core antibody. I think we saw a case today where someone actually was positive for hepatitis B uh, DNA, and I think you have to sort of take that into consideration. How, how much risk is the person uh, at for having active hepatitis, and what's their overall immune status? But you want to give at least, you want to give one dose of any hepatitis B vaccine, and here's where you check those titers in one to two months, and you want to see more than 100, okay? Not 10, 100. And this is really because of durability. So those people are going to have a more durable um, response, and that was shown in a, a study in France a number of years ago uh, in people with HIV. All right, let's go for a minute to um, meningococcal vaccines. There's a little something new here also. So um, we are familiar with ACWY and meningococcal B, and now we have ABCWY. Um, so for all people with HIV who are at least 18 years old, uh, the recommendation is two doses of the quadrivalent vaccine, ACWY, um, given at least eight weeks apart, and then a booster five years later. The meningitis B vaccine is not routinely recommended for everybody with HIV, and so you really want to look at the general population guidelines for that vaccine, and usually this is given to um, people who are younger, college age, um, people with complement deficiencies, or who have asplenia, um, those sort of things. And I think we already heard, unfortunately, there isn't uh, any concrete evidence that the meningococcal B vaccine, particularly for CMB, would prevent gonorrhea, but there is a study in progress, so stay tuned on that. And this new ABCWY vaccine, the um, pentavalent vaccine was approved in October of last year, and the recommendation is just that for somebody who needs both the quadrivalent and the MenB vaccine, um, you can give this vaccine instead. So just very simple. All right, we'll end with Mpox. Yes, it's still here too. How many people have seen a case of Mpox in 2024? Okay. So you remember this curve from 2023 where we were seeing 648 cases a day in the United States. Those were bad times. Um, in 2023, 
we saw a peak of 18 cases um, per day. But as of 2024, up to the current time, there are already 500 cases of MPOX in, um, in the US. And we also know that clade one, now these are mainly clade two um, infections, and those are less serious, um, but clade one infections, which are more virulent and also more transmissible, have been um, seen in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, and even though we haven't seen cases yet in the US, we should all be vigilant, particularly from people who are traveling uh, from the DRC. And I just can't say this loudly or in a more purple way. Um, people with HIV should be prioritized for MPOX vaccination and the treatment uh, and treatment. And this must be done with a racial equity approach. 38% um, of people worldwide with MPOX had HIV, so disproportionate numbers of people. But in a study last year, CDC showed that 94% of people who died who had uh, an HIV serostatus actually had HIV, and almost all of them had a CD4 count less than 50. So this is really important. And I also have to emphasize that 70% of people with MPOX were black. Do you think 70% of people who got vaccines were black? No. So we have a long way to go here in terms of equity. 87% of the people who died in this series of 38 people were non-Hispanic black. So this is a huge disparity. So the good news is that these vaccines actually work. They may not prevent infection, as we see with other vaccines, but they do protect against severity. And these are just three different reports um, that give us data that, that raise our confidence in these vaccines. So there are observational data in vaccinated people that show no deaths or hospitalizations among people who were vaccinated in one series, a low frequency of these bad lesions, the genital ocular mucosal lesions that are so painful, um, definitely reduced by vaccination. And in Seattle, they saw an 83% vaccine efficacy, but that is with two doses, okay? One dose just doesn't cut it. So now is the time for us to be talking with our patients about getting vaccinated because what's going to come up in the summertime? Pride, parties, okay? And so it's really important now that we should help people get vaccinated. Remember those two doses are a month apart. So we want them to be fully vaccinated as people go into a, a higher risk time. So this is the ACIP recommendation from October of last year. They recommend two doses of the Genios vaccine, not the ACAM 2000, Genios. Now that can be um, Sub-Q, it can be intradermal. We started doing intradermal last year because we ran out of vaccine and you can give less with intradermal, but you can do it either way. Um, and so this is the group that they identify as being at risk for MPOX. So gay, bisexual, other men who have sex with men, transgender or non-binary people who in the past six months have had one of the following, a new STD, one, more than one sex partner, sex at a commercial venue or in association with a large public event um, in a geographic area where MPOX transmission is occurring, and also the sexual partners of those people. But here's the kicker, okay? People who anticipate experiencing any of these things, okay? So uh, to me, that really broadens the world. I have a very, very low threshold for recommending MPOX vaccination. 
So um, I would really encourage us to double down on that right now, because now is the time that we can help protect people. And you know what? People don't want to get MPOX. They may not care much about hepatitis B or about COVID or whatever, but nobody wants to get MPOX. So I think this is a time for us to be in sync with our patients and really, really um, encourage uh, these vaccines. So I'm just going to stop there and say thank you. Uh, let's go Vax. Thank you, Melanie. We got some questions at, um, earlier in the lecture about the hepla salve and dosing and things like that, and you, you answered some of them after the questions came in. So um, one question that came in was whether there's any role for using the twin RICS vaccine in HIV-infected patients in 2024? I, I think it's a good question. Um, it is recommended. So the OI guidelines recommend it. Um, it is what would be considered a single dose recombinant um, hepatitis B vaccine. So um, it's convenient because if you want to vaccinate people for A and B, then um, you know it's fewer shots. People like that. But I would only use it for people who really um, are stable, who have high CD4 counts, who um, have controlled virus, uh, who don't have any other um, immune-related things going on, you're going to check that hepatitis B surface antibody titer afterwards, and you have an opportunity to revaccinate those people if they don't get a seroprotective response. But, you know, it is important to recognize that that is a single dose, a single strength dose of hepatitis B surface antigen. And, you know, I also want to mention this because I think it's important to recognize we are all getting kind of excited about the beehive studies now, the, the two parts of that study. And I should have called this out in my presentation, but I want you to recognize that the Ingerix B that was the comparator in that non-responder cohort, that was a single strength dose also, okay? So that was not comparing Heplosav to a double dose of the recombinant vaccine, which is what is recommended. So it might have, you know, the, the comparator arm might have looked different had the double dose, uh, the double strength been used. So I just wanna call that out. That doesn't take away from the immunogenicity of the adjuvant vaccine. So, you know, you see what you see, very high levels of immunogenicity. But I think we have to have a little bit of grain of salt mentality about the comparator. Why don't we go to the microphone? Uh, sure, thanks. That was a great review. Um, so I'm in the middle of redoing our pneumococcal pneumonia policy. And I've been actually looked on up to date. And so they, they're talking about, so this is just pneumococcal vaccinations for adults, they're talking about immunocompromised folks, HIV, but they don't break out by CD4 count, they just say HIV positive. Mm -hmm. So their recommendation would be to give a PCV20, I assume at any CD4 count, followed eight weeks or more by PPSV23. They recognize this is not in the ACIP guidelines, their thought process was there's three valence in PPSV23 that are not covered by PCV20. Have you heard that before? I, I think that's interesting. No, and, and I didn't know that that's what Up to Date was recommending. Um, I, I don't think we have a lot of data to support that, frankly. Um, yes, there may be, you know, three uh, sub, uh, serotypes that aren't representing. Are those the ones that are actually causing the disease in people? That's one question. Um, and, you know, I think um, guidelines are basically um, reliant upon the data that we have. And then we go off a little farther and make our opinion-based recommendations. Um, but I don't see the data to support that recommendation right now. Thank you. 
Go ahead. John. Uh, thanks, Melanie, for a <coughs> great talk. So a lot of attention today to hep B core antibody only persons, and we talked a little bit in the back earlier. Yeah. Are there any data <coughs> in HIV infected persons for if this were to be tested, for what percentage of hep B core antibody pers only persons would be positive for HBB DNA? Um, there may be data. I don't know those data. Um, there are data from an ANRS study uh, done by the French HIV research group, and that was published in 2016, having to do really more with antibody titers. So, um, so I, I don't know, but I, but I do think that what you see is something that is more risk-based. That you know, the the comments are made that in the United States there is a relatively low burden of hepatitis B among the general population, unlike some countries, um, and that it also tends to cluster in some populations more than others. So, you know, I, I think if I were looking um, at the hepatitis B core antibody of a person who's actively injecting drugs, I would be much more likely to get a hepatitis B DNA if it were negative than, you know, the, um, than a person who really has not much in terms of lifetime identifiable risk. I don't think you're wrong to do it. I think the guidelines do say that it is not a general recommendation. So, you know, nice to have the data to guide where those cut points may be. But I don't, does anybody else know those data? Are there any data out there? That's a great answer, thanks. Okay, great. Why don't we move to MPOX now? Um, one question is, if somebody's already had MPOX, do they need to get vaccinated against it? So currently, there isn't a recommendation that those people need to be revaccinated. Um, and I think we haven't learned all that we're going to learn about MPOX as time goes on because you do worry um, about people who got MPOX and who also had um, immune suppression. And how is that going to affect their building up the um, kind of antibodies that should last, last a lifetime. I mean, they should be long-lasting antibodies. That, if you think about the smallpox antibodies to all those things that we got when we were kids, um, you know, those antibodies are supposed to last a lifetime. And, and uh, you know, some of that has been studied, and they are very durable. But I think the question is not answered, really, as to whether particularly people who have um, advanced immune suppression are, would benefit from an additional vaccine. So. And, and since there seems to be maybe some new strains of MPOX coming, I mean, do you anticipate that we're going to have recurrent MPOX vaccinations moving forward every periodically? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I do think it's also about durability. Mm -hmm. So what, uh, what the MPOX experts think is that this clade one um, virus, which is a worse virus um, that we haven't seen here yet, um, would have protection, that the Genios vaccine would be also protective against that clade. So um, there, it's not, I think, the same as we see with COVID, where uh, there is very rapid development, uh, selection of resistance or new variants that we have to chase with new vaccines. So the variants begin to pop up, and then six months from now, we'll have a new vaccine. That doesn't seem to be the case with this virus, um, but, but whether people in certain categories are going to need boosters, I don't know. I think it's a great question. In a person who completed their HPV vaccination in adolescence, subsequently became HIV infected, do you need to give them a booster HPV or restart with another round of HPV vaccine? What's the recommendation? 
Um, it's not recommended that, uh, the, good, the good thing is that person got their vaccines when their immune system was great, their immune system was working, so hopefully they have um, a reservoir of immunity and getting HIV later on uh, would not necessarily disrupt that, but there currently isn't any recommendation for that once someone is fully vaccinated. And then uh, real quickly, is there any hope that recombinant varicella zoster vaccine will be supported through government programs for non-children? You know, it's difficult to get it if you're, if you don't have Medicaid or, or Part B or if you're not insured or. Yeah, and I, I just want to shout out the fact that Medicare is covering it. I yeah. mean, that yeah. was not yeah. the case even last year. So that's, that's, that's a good. start. And, you know, I, um, th those of you who have ever been in a room where I've been talking before know that I always find an advocacy point in everything that I talk about. And here's an advocacy point, okay? It's really important that we have access to these vaccines. And so um, it's very important that, uh, that the government get pressure to be sure that these vaccines are covered. Um, you know, I, I'm actually very disappointed in what has happened with COVID vaccines because, you know, when we, when we had the public health emergency, um, we pretty much could be sure that everybody could get a vaccine yeah. and, you know, yeah. or Paxlovid or whatever. Um, and, and now it's much harder. And, and so I think we really have to continue to put on our advocacy hats and, you know, believe it or not, these people in Washington, they pay attention to what we say as healthcare providers and they take notes if you call and say something, they're gonna write it down and give it to the boss. And you know, the more coordinated those responses are, then they, they do listen. So I think this is a great point for advocacy. Okay, and great. while so you're doing that, maybe you could advocate for the cost of benzathine penicillin to be less than $572 <laughs> for 2.4 million units. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Thompson. We He's really appreciate it. He's gonna cut me you. off before I get on my soapbox. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.